Okay. Wow. There's a lot of people in here. So um, what I thought we would do is just kind of go through some um, video creation tools. Um, and, and, you know, this is, it says remote learning world, but you know what, these could be used in any type of a learning environment because there's a lot of um, things about video and we'll talk about those in just a little bit that that really are shown to benefit um, kids learning strategies and, and those types of things. So just uh, real quick, I guess I'll share my uh, screen with you guys and Come on, time to slow down. All right, share my screen here with you. Um, I think, did you guys, were you guys able to access this in the folder, per chance? I need to see my chat window here. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys are able to find that in the, um, the folder on the spreadsheet there for this presentation. So this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, this, uh, my name is Jeff Cruz, business partner, Dean Phillips. Um, I think we know most folks on here, if you don't, uh, we are both middle school teachers. Um, we have a small company called Beyond the Chalk, and we work with teachers like yourselves to integrate technology, teach teachers how to integrate technology into classroom instruction. Excellent. So thanks for being here uh, this afternoon already um, in this crazy thing we call a remote conference, a virtual conference. So hopefully it's been a um, good experience, probably a learning experience, but nonetheless, hopefully the content has been uh, delivered and you're getting some good value from your time spent here today. All right. So jumping in, just we're going to look real quick at benefits to, you know, to our students in terms of the video. Um, in terms of the sensory part of video, it really doesn't create a more engaging sensory experience for our students versus uh, print materials. I know that some of us uh, were, were uh, working with uh, packets uh, during the, the spring. Uh, others were using videos. And, and um, you, know, you think about some of those learners that are not as, as um, proficient uh, with the, the, the reading text and those kinds of things. It's actually uh, creates an opportunity for them to um, have some success. Um, go to resources, right? Videos can be watched from anywhere. If you're giving a lecture, unless you're recording your lecture, it's awful hard for, for you to, um, to do that again and again and again for students that are gone that have missed. And so it really is a way to push that out to anyone anywhere as long as they have some connectivity along the way. Um, since videos can be stopped and replayed, those types of things, what you'll note is that, is that really that knowledge retention seems to increase. And we're going to show you a tool today that can actually help um, foster that uh, knowledge retention uh, based on that tool and, and how we use it. Um, we can use uh, video in all topic areas, right? So there's some strategies that work better in science and math and other things, but video really can be used across all subject areas uh, and benefit kids. Um, and then again, the, the idea of, of digital literacy, right? We're talking about those four C's that are so important uh, for kids to have before they leave our schools. And, and really this is uh, digital literacy is a 21st century skill that employers are looking for. So video really does a nice job of kind of benefiting students in lots of ways. And, and likewise um, for teachers, it helps us as well, right? So we talk about, um, especially in that online environment, that building of relationships. And, and um, even though we're creating these videos, um, if we hear a voice or see a face, that allows us to connect to those, those folks a little bit easier than if it's somebody that we don't know. Not, not saying that we can't use resources that we don't create, but oftentimes that connection piece is really important. Um, the increased student engagement, again, we talk about learner agency and community and belong, belonging to that. Um, we also talk about the flipped classroom a little bit and, and how we can use video to help us become more efficient with those things that we have to do. So think about... Um, I'm in the, um, what you call it, uh, mini, for the video. Mini... Um, <laughs> mini uh, 
of our schools and of you are probably thinking about how to teach face-to-face as well as pull some of those resources uh, together for our online students who may be online at the same time. And so video creation or the ability to create video is going to be a really important task as well. Um, but let's also, as Jeff said, let's flip that to the student side and, and have the students be able to create that video and submit that video as a learning artifact. That would really help us as teachers be able to provide feedback, be able to see where that learning um, stumble may be. Uh, lots of ways to use video in the classroom as a teacher as well. So think about the, the benefit to students, but also how can I as a teacher benefit from using video um, or provide those opportunities for my students to benefit from creating those videos as well. So um, the name of the game today will be, you know, kind of, um, this is my brother's word, uh, but efficiency, right? How do we take and become more efficient at, at um, getting information to our students and, and in turn for our students to get information back to us? Um, so, so really what we're going to do is we're going to approach video as this way that we can actually push lots of content and we can um, invoke several different strategies while using video to engage kids, to um, um, serve as an assessment uh, piece, and to really kind of hit some different modalities as well. So the first tool we're going to use, and, and actually let me, let, me, let me stop here and say, here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to look at a tool briefly. We might show you a couple ways that you can use it, and then we're going to ask you to play. All right, we have two hours uh, to, to play here, so we're going to ask you to, to not be afraid to jump on and try out these tools. We, you may get lost in one, and that's okay, uh, because our hope today is that, so, or during this conference, is that you walk away with two or three or four tools that you can use in your classroom um, tomorrow if you, if you so desire. So the first tool we're going to start off with is called Screencastify. So and I'm certain that some of you have used Screencastify, especially um, this spring as you jumped into that remote uh, learning world. Screencastify is a Chrome browser extension. So it lives inside the Chrome browser. And so this tool is one that you would use with the Chrome browser. And it's able to record your screen. It's able to record your face, your voice, and, and, and other things. And then once that recording is done, what you can do is you can then edit that um, to, and get it into different um, formats and um, different containers to push that to your students. So what we want to do is we want to take and use Screencastify. Now that I've said, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. I have some how-to videos here. I just included those on there for um, you to use at a later date. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm gonna jump out, um, stop sharing my screen here, and we're going to, maybe I'll have Dean, do you wanna jump in and, or do you wanna drive while I fly? Sure, what would you like me to do? I would like you to just go to a browser window, just open a browser window and, and let's bring up that uh, Screencastify icon here. And maybe we will just very quickly go to the, um, to the Chrome Web Store and show them how to do that with this first one. So while we're waiting for Dean, oh, there he goes. So you're, I guess we're not waiting for Dean at all. No waiting. <laughs> so, so Screencastify is a screen recorder. So think about Khan Academy as a, as a way, you know, or as a, as a analogy of, of what we're using Screencastify for. So, to find an extension in the Chrome Web Store, all you simply have to do is you have to go to a, open a new browser tab and there are lots of ways to get there, but if Dean clicks on his app launcher over here, you notice that the Web Store shows up right there. If you don't see it right there, all you have to do is just type in Chrome Web Store and it's gonna get you to the same place. Screencastify is an extension inside the store. So Dean's gonna go up to that search menu up there, that search window, and he's just gonna type in Screencastify. And he's going to hit the enter key. It's all one word. And you notice that it brings up some different um, extensions here. The first one, Screencastify is the one we want. So if he clicks on it, 
it's going to give us some information about that tool itself. So uh, there you go. So he's going to click on that guy. Here's your screen recorder. Um, so on and so forth. All right, we can do an overview, it kind of gives us an overview of the deal. We can look at reviews. Again, if you start to use more extensions, it's always good to jump in and look at the reviews and see what folks are saying about the tool. Um, and <laughs> I love that one right down below there where it says, this is freaking horrible. Um, there are, I don't, I don't remember, I think there are 11,000 and some odd reviews of this and there are not very many, but of course the first one there says it's freaking horrible. So, um, but it does have four stars out of five. So that's a good sign. If you don't have this installed, you're going to see a, a bar, a, a button up on top, up on the top right. It says add to Chrome. So if you haven't added it yet, just go ahead and tap that and say add to Chrome and hopefully you're able to install that. And Dean was just pointing out there, it does work offline. So if you are not in a spot where you have connectivity, um, it will run offline. All right, so we've got our, our first extension installed, Screencastify. Now we're going to figure out a way to use this in our classroom. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just use the analogy of I want to record a lecture using my slide deck. Okay, so I want to use a, a recorder uh, to record uh, my presentation using my slide deck. So maybe what I'll have Dean do is um, go, to the, go to that first slide, Dean, and let's just pretend that you're going to, or yeah, Screencastify or wherever. And let's go ahead and go up to your extension, Screencastify. And he's going to launch it. Now, the first time you install this, it's going to ask you lots of questions about, hey, um, are you sure you want to do this? And you got to give it permissions and those kinds of things. First three items, that's, that's your choice as to what you want to record. So notice you can record a browser tab. So it only records one tab. Notice Dean has several tabs open, no judgment there. But if he moves to another tab, it won't record. It will only record the tab that he's on. The desktop will record the entire desktop. So not only will it get the screen, the, the, the slide presentation, but it will also get the Zoom screen as well. And then the last one is just a webcam. So if you just want to record yourself, similar to what we're seeing each other on, on the screen there, you can check that piece there too. All right, our microphone is enabled. Uh, right now our webcam is enabled, but let's do this, Dean, since we don't want to necessarily have our face in there, let's just disable that webcam. Dean's going to click on that browser tab and he's going to go ahead and hit record. And Dean, I'll let you, I'll, yep, so we can do, notice we can do the, yeah, so we can do the countdown, the drawing tools, and maybe Dean will show us how to use that and, and add the tab audio. So Dean, it's up, it's, you're up now. It's all you. All right, so here we go. I hit the record button. You can see that I am now recording, so I'm just going to jump into present mode. And again, even if I'm in present mode, it still records because I'm still in that same tab, right? If I hover down at the bottom, Notice I get my um, I get my my Google Slide uh, toolbar, um, but if I if I click down here, oh I guess I've lost my Screencastify toolbar. But anyway, it, it's going to record everything that I talk about or do on the screen. So even if I grab this pointer here inside of my Google Slides and I say, all right, everybody type in this URL right here, right. Um, it's going to record all of those actions as well as that audio with me. The other piece of this, as long as we're in Google Slides, is I'm going to just go ahead and turn on some captions here. Um, and as, as you see, uh, it adds captions to the presentation in real time as well. So this isn't necessarily a Screencastify tool, but this is a Google Slide Deck tool. But think about how this could be important for you as you record, you're also getting a transcript typed out on the top of your screen for those kiddos who maybe um, interfere with things happening at home and get, get their parents getting after them that they have to turn off their, their audio or whatever the case is. They could still listen or watch your presentation and read this uh, text to get them to uh, continue to have that learning experience. All right. So now that I'm done talking, I'm just going to come up here to Screencastify. 
and I'm going to stop that recording. So, so you're going to notice is that what it's done is it's opened a new tab and this is the, this is the video that was created. And you notice up in the top right where it's at that bar going across, it automatically saves it to Google Drive. So when you use Screencastify, it creates a Screencastify folder and all of those videos will be placed inside that Screencastify. And typically, um, it's, uh, it either captures the name if it's a slide presentation or something, or it will give you a date stamp, a date and time um, stamp as well. So, so that's how easy it is to, um, to use Screencastify, right? I mean, it was super easy to jump in. Again, Dean went through that process of turning on closed captions. That's inside of slides. But think of how, as a teacher, you would be able to use that to really um, get your kids, right, to, to engage them in different things. Or you could just push out all of your presentations this way if you wanted. So I'm looking for your questions. You can go in and rename them. Yes, you can go in and rename them. All you have to do is just click up there, I think, on the, the name itself. Can you click on that name, Dean, and see if... Yep, we got halfway across them. Okay. Yep, just rename it right there. So we'll, we can talk, it's a good question by uh, Darcy. So she's wondering how they're better than using Google Meet. Um, Google Meet, you could do the same type of thing. I would say from my experience that Google or Screencastify is a little bit easier to use. Um, I don't have to launch a meeting. All I have to do is go to that tab that I want to record. I click on that Screencastify extension and I'm there. The other part of that that I think is really important is that shared a classroom piece as well. So you notice over on the side there, the right side, I get a shareable link. So if I click on copy shareable link, it's just gonna copy that. I can throw that into Google Classroom. I can embed that into a website, say Google Sites. Um, I can generate a QR code. So there's lots of things you can do inside of, of um, Screencastify. Again, that share to classroom, if Dean, Dean were to click on that, you should, I don't know if you have any classes set up, Dean or not, but it's gonna look for classes that you have under his username and, and we're able to go from there. So the other part of that, you notice down in the bottom there, he has just a couple of tools and this is all part of the, um, the Screencastify free version. So you notice that Dean has the ability to clip that. So if you, let's say you start off, you go, you know, you, you start a little early and a little after you want it to be done. You can just take that and you can clip that using that clipping tool there in order to, um, to, to pare down your video to where you want it to be. Um, with the doc cam. So you want to use Screencastify with the doc cam. I, Dean, do you know, I mean, I guess they're going to see that as another recording device. Do you know if that would work? Yeah, so it should work. So a doc cam probably has some type of software that runs alongside that doc cam. And so usually what a doc cam does is it projects that, that image to your desktop on your computer. And then it takes that computer um, screen and projects it through your projector or onto a, a, a flat panel or, or whatever you, you're using. If you select in Screencastify, if you select the record desktops, uh, option right here, you would be able to record that software that that uh, document camera is going to use. So um, it, it'll record everything that's on your desktop. So really good questions coming up here and, and we want to make sure we try to address these as we go through. Um, like hippo yeah, there, videos. Oh, there, hippo was a, videos. There, was another, there was another question about does it record video? So does Screencastify record video on top on your desktop? And the answer is yes. So um, um, it's it's a great way to record a video and then annotate over the top of it using those tools too, right? So you can annotate over the top of your video. Um, it sounded like there's a football coach in here, <clears throat> Charlo, that maybe is going to try to use Screencastify to. Um, push out some videos that are annotated to his, his team um, using Huddle. So you could record using Screencastify, save it, and push that back out via an, another app as well. 
Um, what else? There were a couple others. Uh, yeah, some hippo videos, another one. Um, I like screencast play. They were actually really good in the spring. Um, develop, or they actually, there's a five minute limit on the free version. I don't think they've, um, I don't know if it's still on or not, but uh, is it, yeah, so Katie's saying yes. So it's still it a five is, minute, yeah. it is a five minute limit? Yeah. Or is it unlimited now? No, I believe it still has a limit to it in the free version. Okay, they changed that in the, in the spring to make it unlimited, but um, I'm guessing they, they changed that back. But um, so, but really, if you think about it, a five minute you know, presentation might be a little bit long to sit. So you might have to break that up, those types of things. Um, yeah, yeah, another question was, uh, will it record more than one um, window at a time on your desktop? And so uh, if you know how to split your screen on your desktop, then it will record everything that's on your desktop. So if you have six different windows open on your desktop, it will record all of those. Um, so for instance, right now, I'll just go ahead and do this so you can kind of see. I'm going to go ahead and open another version of Screencastify. I'm going to record my desktop. Um, and notice you can kind of see my workflow here now once this pops up. But notice you can see that um, I have my screen split into sections, right? Can you see that? Not yet. Let's go ahead and stop it. And now when this generates a thumbnail of this, you should be able to see my screen. So I have the video camera running on one part of my screen. I have my participants and chat in the middle so I can keep track of that. And then I have my Google browser window coming over here. So this is my workflow when I'm using Zoom or Google Meet. I split my screen into a bunch of pieces so that I can keep track of all of those different things as I go through. So some of the issues, you know, you guys are talking about microphones and those types of things, and it does, you know, the, the environment that you're in does make a difference. Uh, the, the quieter it is, the better. If you were going to do this with a group or a class full of 20 kids, it, it gets pretty loud. So you might have to think about how you um, take and modify your classroom structure in order to make that work if you're going to flip that working with kids. Um, other questions, let me still there, will it record your voice as well as the screen? Yes, it will. So I don't know if you noticed that when Dean went to record, there was a tab audio. So it allows you to record the tab audio when you um, set up a, go to browser tab, and if he goes to show more options there, you can actually take and record the tab audio in there as well. Any other questions about that? How do you split your screen, Dean? <laughs> well, that depends on what device you're on. So um, the easiest way is if if you are in a um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share my entire screen so you can see this instead of just a a web page here. Um, so I'm gonna share this entire screen with you. So hopefully you can see the entire screen. It probably looks a little weird for you now, but. Um, the easiest way to do that is just to grab a tab inside of Google Chrome and pull it out. And then that becomes a new version. And then you can resize it or do whatever you need to do with it to make it fit the screen that you have. So um, just grab a tab, and drag that out of your Chrome browser session, and that will split the screen for you. And your, your closed captions are still on. Oh yeah, they are, aren't they? <laughs> no, I was just watching it. With, uh, yeah, that's pretty All effective. Right. Let's uh, escape uh, out of that. There we go. And then to put it back together, um, you can just grab that tab and drag it up, and then you can put it back into your Chrome version uh, up there as well. Dean, somebody asked about how do you do the webcam of the teacher's face along with the screen? Uh, how do you do the webcam of a teacher's face? Okay. So along, with the, along with your screen, yeah. Yep. So inside of Screencastify, we're going to embed this webcam. Um, and then when I hit the record button, notice you can see my webcam is down here. Um, and I should be able to move this around, right? So I, I can bring it up here to the top left corner if I want to. Um, or whatever the case is, but it's inside of Screencastify. As long as I toggle on that webcam 
option, it gives me that option. I can also resize this. So if I want this to be a majority part of the screen, I could do that as well. Um, it's, it's just super flexible inside of Screencastify. Um, other questions. So let's, Dean, let's take one of those. Um, you've got several videos that you've created here. I just want to make sure that, um, let's go to that, that, the, the second tab in there, because I don't think you had a webcam on that one. Okay. Yeah, that's a short one. So one yep. of the things that, one of the things people don't realize is, is there's a download button here. So you can actually download these. So if, if Dean, if you want to click on that download there, what you'll notice is that there's some other options as well. So if you wanted to download an MP4 file, you can. And one of the things that I really like is that export to animated GIF. So an animated GIF is just a bunch of pictures, you know, that, that they have kind of laid together like you do the little flip books. It's a lot smaller than a video. So if you're trying to conserve space, you can actually export an animated GIF of a certain size. So let's say you're trying to get a student to do a specific task, you know, using a piece of technology and it's a kind of a short 10 second thing. You can take and create an animated GIF and Dean's gonna bring this up once it's done here. And um, you can embed that as an image into the slideshow. So it will continuously loop um, as you go through. So let's see. Where that guy is. Here we go. Hopefully we can open that up and take a look. Here we go. You're just gonna throw that in there. A little bit of a bandwidth issue. I may have uh yeah, we're starting to but, slow down, aren't we? Yeah, I may have done it a little too fast quickly. So, and you may want to stop sharing your whole screen, Dean, and just sharing your tab. That's a, that's a message from your wife, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, sorry. She's always looking out for me. <laughs> um, so here's what we want you to do. We want you to play. We're going to give you um, five minutes and um, we'll see where you're at um, as you're going through there. So just, just, Take some time, you know, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have your voice just right. Just take your time, jump into that Screencastify and just try recording a tab or a desktop and see what you can do. Ready, go. And if you have questions, don't, don't, don't be afraid to put that in the chat or, or turn on your mic and ask that question if it's easier to do, that, uh, do it that way for you. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of individuals that have used this, uh, obviously during the remote, um, the remote learning piece uh, spring that we had, and um, it works great. When I hit record, the window just goes away and doesn't make a recording. What am I doing wrong? So, uh, locked on the school computer, possibly. 
Oh, so Rose says locked on hers. Um, Laura, you're not seeing that, um, you're not seeing the little red record dot in the Screencastify um, extension, are you? No, oh, it's just a blue record button. No red dot for recording. When I hit on the extension, it opens up with the options. I hit record and it just completely goes away. <laughs> it just goes away. It doesn't show up on oh, wow. Yeah, I have a very old computer. They're supposed to replace it this month, but who knows? I, mine is doing that too, but then if you go back to it, it says it's recording. I don't know what it's recording. Because Every it, time I go back, it just offers to record it again. And, it's, and then when I go to my recordings, it's not making any recordings. Anyway, yeah. And I wonder, you know, I wonder if we're, we're, we're hitting a bandwidth issue too, you know, as we we're, we're streaming video, right? And we're also trying to use it. I don't, I don't know. Depends on your computer probably. Um, Chad's asking if there, anybody knows if there's a coupon for the unlimited version. Uh, you know, I, I, for me and, and Dean, you can chime in here too, but I think that as a district, um, I think, I think a video recording extension app, now whether it's Screencastify or Hippo or whatever, is a pretty valuable tool um, that would fit under that, um, you know, qualify for that CARES Act money. And, and I am not sure what a school um, license would cost, but that might be something to talk about with your administrators, because I really do feel like this tool can be used across all grade levels. Um, so Sarah is asking about um, using it on the iPad or the phone and Screencastify, this extension does not work on a mobile device. So there's other ways to use you know, your mobile device to, to capture video and things, but um, Screencastify does not work on um, a phone or an iPad. So we should have, we should have said, said the, that earlier. If the kids use it though, um on their phone to watch the video, it should work, shouldn't it? It's just the creation. Absolutely, because they're just MP4 videos, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the workflows that we saw is that teachers would would create their content using Screencastify, and then they just push it to um, Google Classroom. And Google Classroom, as you know, there's an app, you know, for that for your phone or iPad, and and those videos are just sitting there. And you click on it, and you're you're ready to go. Yeah. So, anybody have thoughts? Uh, anybody have uh, thoughts on how they might use this in, in their classroom or how they used it in your classroom? Feel free to, to add that to chat or jump on the mic and, and uh, share with the rest of the group. So I found Screencastify really useful for giving feedback to my students when we were in remote learning. Um, so if they turn in an essay, I could give them like a one minute video response, um, which I found they were more likely to watch than reading through a bunch of comments in a Google Doc. Very cool. How did, so how did you do that, Tricia, with the, with the video comment? Do you remember? I think what I landed on most often was I would put a comment on their title or something of the paper and the, and the comment would be a link to the video. Oh, gotcha. Um, and then sometimes I might put below that, like, watch this and then tell me, make the change to paragraph two and resubmit. So there was something for them to do based on my feedback. Yeah, wow. So great, and, and some great comments coming up in the chat as well. I think that's a great idea, Trish. I really like that idea. And it's probably easier than you having to type, you know, your comments for 20 some papers, right? Or, or whatever you have. Yeah. But All my, right. On my um, computer, I used Screencast-O-Matic a little bit easier, and it recorded a little bit longer video. Um, I used it um, in kindergarten. Um, I would show them color blocks that represented, they were icons for rhythm. And then I could, uh, you know, I made a uh, PowerPoint, and then I could, um, 
point along while I said it and then they could say it back to me. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's a great idea. Um, and you said you use screencast. screencast. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a little easier with the computer I was using. Okay. To use that. Yeah. And, it, and it allows 15 minutes. Instead of 15. Five. Yeah. Um, Lisa, I like I like Lisa's comment here. Lisa, you want to talk about how you use that for um, your students, kind of a how-to video? Um, yeah, it was kind of a learning curve for all of us because we thought students would easily be able to figure out Google Classroom because, you know, we always say they're really quick and savvy about picking up technology, but that was not the case, and it was a lot of, I turned it in, and... Um, and parents struggling too because they weren't sure how to help. So we did a lot of tutorial videos and we could have, <clears throat> we had a student account we could log in and use. So we could go in and re record us as if we were a student turning in assignments or where do you go to find certain information or I had some students using some features in Google Docs and they weren't sure how to get those to pop up. So it was just really easy to send up a quick video than having to type out a how to right. save time. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise you have to say it 40, 50, 60 times, right? So why not use that video and archive that video somewhere where if a student has a question, they miss a day or whatever, they, you know, you just push out the video to them. And then if they have questions after, then you can help them. Yeah. Because when they would ask over and over, I would always just either send the link or just say, go to Google Classroom, look at tutorial videos. And that was a really quick, easy way to make them go and be responsible and do it instead of, like you said, saying it over and over again. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Tutorials, explain lessons, the shorter format, video within videos works, just tried it. So everybody's trying oh, in Huddle, huh? So looks like Reese tried it in Huddle. Um, the tutorials, explaining an assignment, doing example slides, for example, like the tools being used to highlight and draw attention to. Um, yeah, the videos go to Google Drive. And remember, if you're on a school account, you have unlimited space, right, inside of Google Drive. So that really is, I mean, so there's really no worry in terms of having to, to worry about uh, space issues if you're inside your, your school account. Somebody just asked, is it possible for students to share their screens like with Zoom? Um, I think you're referring to Screencastify. Um, <laughs> there's probably some workarounds you could make with those, you know, in terms of, of how you might do that. Um, but I don't think you can share a video. I mean, I don't think you could share a, a Screencastify video was some you could share the the finished video but i don't think you could share the actual video experience with anybody else any other questions so i'm going to go back into the screen share here and oops i thought all right, we're going to go back into screen share. We'll find that presentation there. I'll share my screen and we'll just kind of go through some of these other pieces here. I'm going to go back up one. And my computer's starting to run slow now. So these are just some, some ideas, some other ideas in terms of uses for um, Screencastify. So instructional videos, as you guys talked about, um, giving a speech or performance. So it's, sometimes it's nice for the student, even though it's hard to hear your own voice, it's nice for them to record that, right? And they get a chance to see what kind of mannerisms they have. I always I talk with my hands a lot. I, I know that now that I've started to watch videos of myself. Um, fluency practice. So think about how that might help students that, uh, you know, to practice fluency. Uh, you, Trisha, talked about providing feedback. Um, dubbing a video, so you add your own voice over a video, and then students explaining their understanding of, of certain concepts. So those are just some, some thoughtful or some ideas on how you can uh, use Screencastify. Dean, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think, um, I think it's great that you guys are all sharing ideas. Um, again, remember the, the flip side of that, right? So think about the power behind students creating those, those screen recordings and submitting those as artifacts of learning, right? So um, that can be very powerful as well. 
All right. No further questions. Any further questions on the uh, screencastify? All right. We're going to jump into number two here. So Adobe Spark. So if you haven't used Adobe Spark, this is an interesting um, tool as well. It doesn't just do video. It does other, other things as well, images and, and websites and, and different things. But we're going to focus on the, the video aspect uh, of Adobe Spark. So Adobe um, is a free web app-based um, video and graphics creation tool. And uh, the way that you access it is just spark.adobe.com. You know, hopefully everybody has access to that uh, slide presentation. And um, what we can do, there is a how-to video on there if you want to check that out at a later date. But, but um, let's just jump into Adobe here and let's see if we can get Adobe Spark to come up. My computer or my, my internet is starting to slow down quite a lot right now. So I'm hopefully I don't, uh, I don't lose you. Um, Jeff, you want me to drive? Yeah, can you drive? Yeah, let's drive. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen then, and then you can. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so here we are. We're at the uh, Adobe Spark, uh, Adobe Spark, you know, kind of home screen. You notice that Dean's kind of scrolling down, and, and like I said, you can do lots of things inside of Adobe Spark. We're going to focus on the video piece, and uh, Dean's is just going to click on create a video. And what you're going to notice is that it's going to make him sign in with Google. Dean's got lots of accounts, and um, hopefully, this is going to start up for us, and, and we're going to kind of get a sense of where we are. So we're gonna to have to figure out what we want to do in order to tell our story with Spark here. So where do you wanna, where do we wanna go, Dean? So let's go, yeah, let's go to, yep, there you go. So click across there. Um, let's do a, Actually, just come up here to your plus sign up here. Does it give you, does it up at your, yeah, does it, does it give you an option? Um, there you go. There's your video. Okay. So we're going to click on video. And this kind of, what's, what's really nice about uh, Adobe Spark is it, it, is it kind of gives you the prompts you need to build a, a video piece here. So let's just say um, teaching in times of uncertainty. Let's just do a, let's just, there you go. And so there's our title here, and we'll see how so this is going to prompt us to go next. So a good night's sleep, not a mattress. How can you connect your product or service to a universal? So it's kind of talking about this whole the marketing side of, of video and what you need to do. It's going to give you a, a short tutorial. This is how you do this. And once you're done, you can click on I'm ready. And so this is where you can start to add different things. You've got kind of your, your um, interface here. You got full screen, you can do a split screen, a caption, those types of things. So you notice the first aspect of that right there where it says video. Dean can actually click on that and he can drop a video into this Adobe Spark piece right here. So clicks on that, it's gonna say, all right, let's find a video that I can use. So if he had used Screencastify to create a video, right, he could actually take and import that video into this document right here. Or if you've, you know, maybe you, you've taken a video um, from your phone and you've uploaded it to your, to your computer. Um, there's lots of ways you can get video into your, um, into your computer. And then you've got your text piece, of course. So that's where you're gonna add titles, different kind of text pieces in here that you can, um, there you go. And you notice it's kind of keeping a, a specific format and if you are, um, and if you don't like, there you go. So you can increase the size of the font, you can get rid of it. Notice up in the top right, there's a layout, a theme, a resize and music. So you can change that theme um, to kind of fit your needs. Now, it, what's, what's interesting about Adobe Spark is it kind of gives you these templates. You don't have a lot of, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say you don't have a lot of customization, but you have some customization, but you don't have complete customization uh, when you're doing this. And then um, we can change your layout a little bit. We, right now we're at full screen. 
Um, and then notice down below, you kind of on your timeline, you have your different screens or your different um, of, uh, screens down below. So Dean can click on that. Now he can go in, he can find a photo if he wants to add to that. Notice he's adding these different tiles here, adding icons. He's gonna go out and find an icon look for a bicycle. So there's some icons and he's going to just kind of click on one and there's your bicycle right there. So you can do all kinds of different, you know, several different things in here. Now when you're, when you're, when you're done or when you want to preview it up in the top there, you notice there's a preview button up there. We can kind of just take a look and let's see what happens here. So it's 16 seconds right now and it moves out around a little bit and those are other slides right in there. When you're done, you can take and you can share this out as a, as a video. You can download the video. Um, Dean's gonna go ahead and add some music here because it's a little bit boring. Yep, it's kind of a slideshow video, you're right. So, um, so instead of it being a, a slide by slide by slide that you have to advance, it's gonna be just a continuously running uh, video. I think the age limit um, for Spark is 13. Um, that would be something, I'm almost positive that's what it is because I looked it up just the other day. Um, I'm trying to look at all these others. Age limit for Spark, essentially a slideshow video, make it a frame by frame. Yep, so again, Spark, Spark, instead of just kind of starting with a blank canvas, it gives you some things that allow you to, um, you know, again, it gives you a head start, I guess, in creating your content. Questions you guys have on this? When sharing, will it have a web address you can share, like, or URL? Well, Dean just shared that with me. I'm gonna go. I don't have it yet. Oh, there it is. So now what Dean did with me is he said I could start collaborating with him. Right, so now somebody asked about the Screencastify, the ability to collaborate. I can actually jump in now and I am going to uh, be in that same project as Dean there and uh, we have the ability to collaborate on that effectively. It's still kind of starting up there, but now I can see all of Dean's edits here and okay, I'm ready. And I can start adding information as well. Oh, so the, the only part about this is that I'm getting a Dean is currently editing this project. So I can pre, I can open this later. So you can't actually collaboratively, you know, work on this, but you can take and um, share uh, the project with each other, but you can't work on it at the same time. And you notice there's a classroom link right there too, right? as well as Google Teams and, and other pieces. Okay, any questions? We're gonna, let's do this. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and jump into Adobe Spark. Um, some of you, I think, and I'm thinking you might wanna just go back to screen, you know, if you, if you feel like you wanna just go back to Screencastify, feel free to do so. But, um, you know, this is kind of a time for, for you to play, to try out different tools, to think about how you might wanna use them. And um, the only way you're going to figure that out is to, to jump in and, and play with each one of them. So why don't you just give it a shot and see where you end up. We'll give you about five minutes to do that. If you have questions, please uh, jump on the mic or um, put your questions into the chat and we'll try to answer them as best we can. So it looks like Trish is asking about Kaltura. Hmm. 
anybody knows about Kaltura, feel free to jump into that chat window and Are they, so Trish, I have a question for you. Are they, are they doing all their video conferencing with, with Kaltura or are they just creating videos with Kaltura? Kaltura, Kaltura? Um, I was just talking with them about th that's what teachers will be creating. So I don't know if it has other functions too, but it came up in some MTDA conversations and somewhere else that I was. I just, I want to be able to know how to use one really well <laughs> and yeah. not jump around and be trying to learn a lot of systems. So just wondering if anyone does know. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I haven't, I have never used it. So I'm not sure how it works. I think um, it looks pretty robust though, doesn't it in terms of what you can do with it. So it looks like there's some folks that are blocked um, from using the Adobe Spark. That's a good question by Mona. I had, so you may not, I, I, I don't think you're gonna be able to share right out from Adobe Spark, but if you did create a link you could then take that link and put it into Google Classroom, at which point it would work fine. Spark was, was purchased by uh, Microsoft, so it is free. I think there are limits to how much you can, um, how many projects you can have. And um, I was gonna look that up and I just didn't get to, a chance to do that. So, um, but it is free at this point. And, um, but, but just like anything else, there are limits to it as well. So, so Megan looked up, says 6% off for all Adobe cloud software. That's a pretty good deal on Adobe stuff. Um, I'm wondering if we're, we're running into some, some bandwidth issues from some people, because uh, you know, it's, it should be free. Um, if you're on your school network, then um, sometimes for whatever reason, uh, sites get blocked. Um, there's no, I, I guess I, wouldn't think that we needed to worry about Adobe Spark as being a, a, a site that we shouldn't allow students to access. But um, sometimes those get thrown into a, a system and <laughs> it's hard to get them out sometimes. I'll give you just, uh, give you just a couple more minutes here and We'll kind of reconnect here and, and debrief a little bit on this tool.
So I thought for some reason I was thinking that it was free um, at a certain level under no, so instead of being only free for two months, I wonder if it's just free, if the pro version is free for two months and then if you don't, you get downgraded to the other uh, account. Is that, does anybody know if that's right or not? Nice. I love looking at the, watching the chat. You guys are helping each other out. You know, some of you obviously used this before. Yeah, see, I thought it was free for educators as well. Nice. Okay, so let's, um, let's kind of debrief a little bit on this one. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts? What do you, you know, how, how might you use this um, in your class or have your students use it as well? Jump on the mic, enter your, your thoughts into a chat. I could see using this as an engagement activity at the beginning with the videos and the slides playing with the music behind them to get them just hooked into the lesson before you dive into it. So you would create something, Michelle, right, for them to, to kind of just start the lesson off. Yep, just to start it off, yeah, as they walk yeah. in. Awesome. So it looks like some of you have used this. It looks like Rachel used it. Your 15 minute presentation, that's a pretty long presentation with music. So you choose how long your picture stays upright. So you have some, some functionality there that um, you may not have with a more, a less sophisticated tool. So like that Whitney's talking about, yeah, that, that potential for going back to remote and having that, how to video for your parents. I think that's a great idea. Cause again, it's a nice, has some nice, you know, aesthetics to it and um, makes a nice looking video. Looks like Alyssa's gonna, or Alyssa's gonna take and do something with an introductory slide. So her teacher page, so maybe some video or some, some video or some images of her and her family doing certain things to kind of introduce herself to her new class coming in. Nice. The tag team edit is good. Yeah, middle schoolers. So I think that you're right, Brandon. Middle schoolers would probably appreciate it's a little bit more sophisticated than, than some other video editing tools. I think they would appreciate that. Awesome. Any other thoughts before we move on? Mr. Phillips? No, I, I, Adobe Spark is one of my favorite tools. Um, and, and once you get into Adobe Spark and you look at the video piece, there's all kinds of other tools in that suite of tools as well um, that could be useful to you. So check out their web page designer, uh, super intuitive, super easy to make a really fancy looking web page if you're interested in something like that, as well as some of their other tools. So. Uh, the video creation tool is wonderful. It's simple enough that most of us can figure out how to do it, but yet it has some of those advanced features to make it look like a really polished end product as well. So just some additional ideas here again, um, just uh, to where you could use Adobe Spark. Um, some narrative prompts. I like the idea of that narrative prompt, you know, you kind of give the prompt and they have to, to go from there rhyming games, um, foreign language teachers. Think about how a foreign language teacher could use a, a video um, series to you know, show a, a certain level of understanding for a second language. Story starters, so think about how you could use that with, with smaller kids, uh, younger kids, uh, creative storytelling. Um, yeah, just lots of different things. I like the photo essays and the student portfolios too. It's a different way of, of um, archiving information, you know, into a video sequence there that might uh, might really motivate some of your students to, to put their stuff into a, a digital format and, and really work hard to create that. So remember, one of the, the, the biggest, one of the, the largest word in our word cloud for Menti, our biggest struggle was engagement, right? Our student engagement. So I think thinking of ways that we can engage or challenge our students, you know, to, to really 
uh, take an interest in their learning, that's really what I think is, is, is key to, to getting our kids to engage. And I think video um, is one of those tools that we could use to, to make that happen. All right, any other thoughts or questions? Both of these tools, okay. All right, so let's go on to the next one, number three. Now, this one's an interesting one. They've changed it a little bit, the YouTube Creator Studio. So I don't know if a lot of you have um, YouTube accounts. Um, over the years, I've done some online classes and created some YouTube um, videos, and so and I've created a channel as well. And, and, that, and that's great, but you can also actually edit video inside of YouTube. So a lot of times people are saying, hey, I got this big video and I wanna, I wanna clip it down, I wanna do different things with it. Well, you can do that. And, and, and if you're on a Chromebook especially, where you don't have access to a lot of video editing tools, um, you can go into YouTube, into the Creator Studio, and you can actually um, make that happen. Dean, do you wanna drive or you want me to drive? Um, you better drive on this one. I don't know if I have access to the Creator Studio. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and jump out here and see and share. I'll just share my whole screen here and that will make it easier. Um, share screen, desktop, that might get a little, actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna share this tab. Um, okay, click on share. And so, hopefully you guys can see that there. Um, so what I can do is I can come over here and I can click on my name over here. Oops. And if I come down to YouTube Studio, so this is just in my personal Google account here. Um, I go to YouTube Studio. What that's going to do is that's going to get me to all of my videos that I've uploaded in the past. So one of the things about YouTube Video, um, you can't necessarily create the video. Actually, you can. You could go live if you wanted to. But the video is typically created already. You've uploaded it, and now you're going to go into the studio and um, do some modifications here. And wow, it's really slow right now. So I'm gonna just jump into here under videos. And what you'll notice, there are a couple things that, that you'll notice is on the far right, top right of my screen, there's the create. That's where I can actually upload a video or I can go live. Now the live is a little bit funky because you, you sometimes you need like an encoder uh, to work with this, but I'm just gonna take a video, for example, the Screencastify video that I um, linked off of the, uh, the page. And you notice down here, I've got some different things that I can do. Now, the Creator Studio is not just about editing video. You can actually look at analytics. You can actually look at um, the monetization of your videos. So let's say you're, you know, you just, you're just really into creating videos and you want to monetize those. You can actually do that. In order to do that, you got to make sure you don't have any um, you know, copyrighted music or anything like that uh, to go with those. So if I click on this details or this, whoops, this Screencastify piece right here. Boy, my computer is just really, oh, there we go. Thinking hard today. Um, I might have to restart in between sessions here. Um, you notice when I get to my video details, I can, I can change the description, those types of things. I've got my, um, my link over here. I can change whether it's public, private, um, those types of things, upload a thumbnail. But notice over here on the left, I have my editor. And within my editor, this is where I can actually take and start to uh, change some things inside of, of this video piece right here. So I can, I can crop and I can do a couple different things. You notice I've got a uh, kind of a, um, a timeline down there on the bottom. Looks like I have some sound. I can add a bit of a blur and different things inside of this. Notice I can trim over on this side as well. So it's a, it's a simple video editor, but again, um, for those folks, again, what we've seen is, is folks running Chromebooks, they'll jump into the video editor and do their editing inside of here. At which point, it throws a YouTube link, which we know you can embed into Google Slides, Docs, and lots of other places. So just something to, to consider as you're, um, you know, you're thinking about using video in your classroom.
Yeah. One, one thing also to consider is um, whether or not YouTube is blocked by your district, right? So some of our districts have YouTube uh, either filtered very heavily or blocked. So um, that may influence the decision of which video creation tool you are able to use or that you want to use. Uh, even though YouTube is wonderful, lots of ways to um, keep videos private, add specific people, much like all of our other Google tools that sharing is built in and it's very robust. But again, sometimes our filters are such that it doesn't allow us to use these tools. Um, so, and I guess the other thing, and I'm just reading these, these um, the comments here, it looks like Whitney. How talking. did you know? Oops. Um, Whitney talks about using the um, the video platform and the analytics because in the in the within YouTube you can see how many views you've had those types of things so you can actually kind of figure out are, are kids really watching these videos right I mean are they really you know paying attention and and uh, so you can use some of those analytics to do that the other thing about studio or or YouTube that I really like is you can start to create channels so most of you have probably heard of Bozeman Biology um, you know, Paul is amazing over there paul anderson and he's created all these different channels and so you can actually you can actually put a channel into a um, on, into a website so you have all these videos in one you don't have to get every one individually you can just actually add a channel like that so um why don't you guys just kind of jump into video you know that that um youtube studio and just kind of play around a little bit remember you can just go to youtube in the top right, you'll see your uh, icon, your your where your name is, and then all you have to do is just go down to um, I think it's YouTube Studio. So go ahead and play with that for about uh, five ten minutes, and then we'll come back together for our next one. Jeff, if you want to make me host and try to restart your computer real quick. Um, make you a host? Okay, that you're way. now the host. You got that way it doesn't kick everybody out when you leave. Are, is yours, you're not, you're not, you don't seem to be slowing down much. Mine's just kind of. Oh, it's, it's revving up pretty good. <laughs> yours is? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm still. Great idea about the playlist, you know, it says that you can actually group those into a certain order, right? So as you go through the year and you create videos, you add them to YouTube, um, you create that playlist, right? So those kids that uh, sometimes, and, and I, I keep hearing that um, there's going to be the remote option in most schools, even though kids are back face to face. And so I think that as a teacher, that would concern me. How am I going to manage the on-site versus the remote students? And, and I think video and, and playlists, those types of things, to me, that makes sense um, to, uh, to use that technology to, to help organize those resources. Looks like Maggie was using the read along videos, right? Uh, read aloud videos, I guess. So her students could watch the stories on their own. You know, here's the thing about video 
it, the hardest part is that when you hear yourself speaking, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I don't sound like that. I really don't. But you do. You just sound differently to your, yourself. Everybody, <laughs> that's what everybody thinks you sound like. So sometimes getting over that is, 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 uh, is hard, but it's a necessary evil if you're going to put out a lot of video of, your, of yourself. So Sheila says that her school would be videoing all teachers' lessons for students who choose to stay home. I'm kind of interested, Sheila, how that's going to work. How are you going to record all those videos? What are you using to do that? And where are you going to uh, store them? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> really, yeah, those are those makes for some good questions. So guys, I'm doing that too for my classroom. And um I'm using the HIPPO video because I just bought a membership through them or a subscription in the spring. And um, the only downfall is I can't say any of the kids' names, especially if I'm going to send it out to all the kids just because of legal things. Um, but I was thinking of maybe doing the YouTube live because then it's, then they could actually see it live right then versus screencasts um, and Hippo, you have to record it, then post it. Right. Um, or you could do Google Meets. I know you can do, set up the meeting that way or Zoom like we're doing, but that's because kids are going to have to do it. I had to do that this spring just because I taught Microsoft Office, but kids don't have a Microsoft Office at home, so I had to teach them how to do everything Microsoft Office, but on Google Docs or whatever we were doing. And I did the hippo and the um, the screencastify. That was the easiest way so far that I found. But we're gonna have kids opt out for in yeah. school, but they still need to have the lessons. Absolutely. Um, so so and you know I'm I'm just kind of curious when you're saying we're supposed to be recording while teaching. So you're gonna have a video camera, your phone, an iPad. What's that gonna look like? Well, I have a laptop and it's going to, it has the webcam on it. And then it's also gonna be recording my screen. So, but the camera can't show any kids. So it's gotta be strictly me. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna try to figure it out. That's why I'm here is trying to see other avenues possibly besides the one I have. It's, it's, it's a really, yeah, it's a really tough question, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, I wonder if, if, if the videos are only on in Google Classroom, in that classroom, can you show students? So, Jeff, we are um, not doing that currently. We, as you guys know, everything changes day by day. We were originally going to start in a brick and mortar, but now we're starting virtual for our first quarter. And then we're going to try to move to brick and mortar. But so what they were saying is once we get to brick and mortar, there's about half of our families that are not comfortable with sending their students back to school. And that may change. But so the idea is they're buying us video cameras, like everything's still up in the air. I don't know the details yet, but they're gonna be buying us cameras that I guess can follow us around kind of like. Um, yeah, a swivel, five, five it's probably a, is it swivel? Yes, and yeah. so the cameras will do their thing and I'm not even sure of what application we're gonna use, whether it's gonna be Zoom or something else. It's still kind of up in the air. I just know the basics of that we're expected to video our lessons so the students at home can have the same access to the instructions as the kids in the classroom. Sure. Okay. So yeah, I'm just here to learn as much as I can regarding <laughs> as well. Trying to figure it out. That's right. Yes. Um, yeah, so a, a couple more with that. A uh, couple more thoughts with that conversation. So I think the security of the students is a big issue, right? So making sure you're not saying names and videoing faces that aren't supposed to be there and where you're going to host that, but also um, making sure your infrastructure is in check as well. If you think about having 15 classes all streaming live at the same time, that may be a big hurdle to overcome as well. So 
Um, <clears throat> lots, lots of conversation to be had about that strategy, I think. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, we do have a huge um, internet structure already. We have lots of servers and stuff, but it's just a good point. We all have like smart, um, well, they just changed it right before COVID happened, but we all got new, um, shoot, now I can't even think of what they're called, but like the latest smart boards, mm -hmm. right? I can't, I can't recall the name of them, but all of our, so they had to reamp our whole um, internet structure because of that. So they would all work for all the teachers. So hopefully that'll work. <laughs> Yeah, so lots of it just you know it's it's funny because it just brings up so many questions, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. um, it's hard. It's it's going to be hard. Uh, Daisy uh, Dean posted the swivel link there in the chat there. So if you if you want to look at that, that's a pretty cool piece of technology. Um, Daisy posted the double robots um, in there, which is a pretty super sweet uh, piece of technology that you can move around the room that kind of thing. So um, there's some, there are some options out there. There's an expense to those options too. And thinking about how you're going to outfit an entire school when technology gets a little bit daunting. And, and, it, and if you can find the technology even quite honestly, mm -hmm. we were talking to somebody yesterday and they said, if you want to buy a Dell Chromebook, you might as well wait, uh, plan on waiting until January to get one. So way, things are way out. Somebody did ask a question on Screencastify. How do I push Screencastify right to YouTube? Well, it's, it's actually, once you record your video, over on the right-hand side, there's a link that allows you to push directly to YouTube. So um, it's super simple to take your, so, and, and there's no reason you can't stack these apps too, right? So Screencastify serves one purpose, YouTube serves another purpose. We're going to show you another tool that would probably sure serve a third purpose here. So, um, yeah, that Alicia is, is talking about um, the whole, YouTube and the live streaming and you have to get in the encoder and stuff like that. So um, there, there's some tutorials out there, but they're not that easy to follow to be quite honest with you. Yeah, and I think in YouTube to live stream, you also have to have, be a verified account. Um, you can't just be a, a regular YouTube account that goes along with uh, uploading more than I think, do you know the upload limitations in YouTube? I think it's 20 minutes unless you have that verified account and then yeah, you can upload longer right. as well. Um, so there's a couple steps in YouTube as well that uh, uh, you have to jump through if you're gonna use it extensively as your tool. So, and, and just, we're just gonna make sure we're, we're reinforcing this idea that we're not, we're, we're trying to let you have some time to just play a little bit uh, in between these tools. Um, but in order to, to get to this, this uh, next one, we wanna make sure we, uh, we're gonna go ahead and move forward. So this next tool here, I'll go ahead and share my screen. This next tool. Oh, actually we'll talk a little bit about just, just how you can use um, YouTube, uh, Studio Creator, or Creator Studio. Uh, we can create a channel or a playlist. Somebody uh, already uh, talked about that. That visit video repository, okay? So you can get it from anywhere, from a device. Oh, and by the way, one of the things I didn't mention is that there is a um, YouTube Studio Creator app for your phone. You can't edit videos, but you can check analytics and those types of things from that app and then adding audio tracks to video as well. So it's just some different features in each one of these video um, tools that we're showing you tonight today. Some of you may find the, the Screencastify sufficient, others may want a little bit more um, customization. All right, so next one. This one, if you haven't seen Edpuzzle, this one's, um, this one's really interesting. So we've got the video created. Now, how do we, how do we, you know, hold our students accountable, right? So when you start thinking about 
that creation. And I think somebody mentioned the analytics and you know how many students are watching. We can actually embed questions into our video using Edpuzzle. So if you haven't seen Edpuzzle, this is a, this is a pretty powerful tool. Um, it's a web-based interactive video, formative assessment tool. So we can crop existing online videos and we can add content to specific you know, areas of the video to target specific learning objectives, right? So super um, powerful way of taking created video or video that, that you created and adding that to a, um, uh, or, or adding your own content to that. So Dean's gonna go ahead and jump into Edpuzzle and I'll let him drive and go from there. Yeah, so the first thing in Edpuzzle, if you wanna have that interactivity piece is you're gonna have to create a class. So you can either create a class inside of Edpuzzle or you can sync your Google Classroom. Uh, what that effectively does is it builds that class inside of Edpuzzle, which is a little bit of a hindrance in my opinion because now I have to go to Edpuzzle and log into Edpuzzle to get that content to flow both ways. Um, but nonetheless, Edpuzzle is a super powerful tool. So you're gonna to have to build your class first. Then of course you have your grade book that's um, associated with your class and the activities that you push out to your class flow into the grade book in Edpuzzle. Unfortunately, it doesn't flow into the grade book in Google Classroom. Um, the only thing that Google Classroom is used is to build your roster for your classroom inside of Edpuzzle. So, um, and then of course we can, click on our content piece, all kinds of content inside of Edpuzzle. Um, if I click on the curriculum here, um, I can search by grade level for content. So I'm gonna jump into elementary school and inside of elementary school, it pulls up all these things that they say, oh, these are pretty popular, you may like these. But I can also search by subject, um, maybe math, social studies, language, um, I can also search by grade level as well. So inside of that elementary school content, I can search by grade level. Um, I'm just gonna jump back out here and I'm gonna pick one um, by subject and we're gonna jump into science. And of course, then it breaks it down into other categories, human body, science skills, chemistry, life science, all of those great things. So then I can kind of scroll through my videos and on my videos, I can see how long these videos are, but there's also little pieces that show me where the uh, interaction is too, right? So um, I'm gonna try to find one that has some interaction, interactivity built into it. So direct sunlight. Um, unfortunately, I don't think this one has. So there's just a different versions, yeah. Yeah, let's see all these different versions here. Um, let me go back out to just regular old curriculum here, elementary school. Um, when I see a video that has these little um, upside down droplets by it, a diamond shape or whatever you want, whatever this shape is, balloon, um, that shows me that there's some interactivity built into this video. So think about using Screencastify or Adobe Spark, creating these videos uploading them into Edpuzzle and then adding some interactivity behind it, right? So what does that look like? So here's my, my video coming right from YouTube and everywhere you see one of these droplets, there is interactivity built in. So notice on the right hand side, at one minute and 28 seconds in this video, there's a multiple choice question. At one minute 43 seconds, there's another multiple choice question. So again, when I click on click on these, um, it allows me to see the part of the video and then here's the question that's added, right? So which of these shows three and a half? Well, then my students have to select the correct answer um, and then they get a grade on this because this is a graded activity inside of Edpuzzle. So again, brain research says five to seven minutes for elementary kids five to 10 minutes for our high school kids, up to 15 minutes, that chunking, right? They're gonna watch a part of the lesson before we're gonna switch those modalities and ask our students to do something. And Edpuzzle is a great tool to do that. Um, and again, so I'll, I'll jump back out so we can kind of watch how this works in this whole video here. 
Um, I'll just play the video. Today we are learning how to change a mixed number into an improper fit with two and, and one fourth mixed number as one fourth to represent this these two fractions because. So obviously the video is taking them taking you through how to read a fraction and identify a fraction using some manipulatives, even though they're digital, right? And so as the student gets to this point in the video, they're asked a comprehension question on the content of that video. Um, once they're done with that, I can choose three and a half here. Um, then they get to see if they got it right or not. If it says, yeah, you got it right, then you get the opportunity to continue. If you got it wrong, you get the opportunity to rewatch, right? So you can go back and, and continue that. We start by drawing three holes as three squares, and then we draw one half more as one half of a square. Now, as an improper fraction, we can't have whole numbers. How should I split up my whole squares? So again, a comprehension question, right? How should they split up their whole, whole squares, those whole numbers, to represent those improper fractions. So you can see how Ed, Edpuzzle builds in that interactivity into those videos, um, that comprehension piece, that accountability as students watch uh, content that's either created or used in the form of a video. So Dean, uh, I think that they've changed it uh, now that, to where um, you're able to push uh, your information into Google Classroom. So actually you can oh. actually import grades automatically now. Excellent. So it goes is, yeah. Excellent. Good. Um, and then there's a couple other questions um, like Megan. Well, this would have been great when I was teaching math and had no idea what I was doing. I like <laughs> <laughs> and, and my understanding is that uh, Michelle's question, do students have to log into Edpuzzle? If you've connected it to Google Classroom um, and you, you're going to actually create that assignment in Google or for Google Classroom, all they have to do is log into Google Classroom and they should be able to access that and those grades will flow across. Excellent. And that, that was one of the big hurdles for me in Edpuzzle is that I had to go somewhere else to get that content. And now that it's linked to Google Classroom, that will definitely make this, um, this tool much user friendly, much more user friendly. Dean, what if I what if I like somebody's uh, you know Ed Puzzle, but I want to add my own stuff? Yeah, so um, you can always build your own stuff, right? So there's this my content piece here as well. So if I click into my content, um, it gives me anything that I've um, liked or saved, and it also gives me the opportunity to add content, right? So I'm going to add content. I can either create a video right here in Ed Puzzle. I can upload a video, which then allows me to add the interactive pieces to it, um, or I can create a project as well. So if I just upload a video, I'm going to go to um, this teaching in times of uncertainty that we used Screencastify to, bit, um, to pull in, right? So that's just uploading this video from Screencastify that I just created earlier today. And it's going to pull that in as a video. It may take a little bit to render. It looks like it's um, trying to crawl there a little bit. But um, then once I have that video there, then I can add content. So if I click into this video, anywhere where I place my, my cursor inside the video, um, exponential growth. I can add interactivity to it, right? So I can come in here and I can, let's see if I can figure out how to add content here. Um, maybe I have to unlock this video because this one isn't mine yet. Dean, can you just edit it on the bottom right? There we go. Thank you. So when I was in high school. So I can grab my slider and slide this along. And then once I get to a specific spot, I should be able to, I can either do a voiceover. So I can add a voiceover right there. I can cut or I can add a question at a specific spot inside my video. So, um, and then when I'm adding questions, I have the opportunity to add a multiple choice question. 
an open-ended question, or maybe I just want to call attention to a specific item within the video, I can just add a note that they have to stop, pause the video, read the note, and then continue on. So um, lots of different ways that you can add content to your videos. Um, so a couple, couple really good questions. I love Whitney's, you know, <laughs> I don't know why we have to play this game of, you know, YouTube's block, so we have to figure out ways around it because, um, I use YouTube all the time to figure things out and fix things. And I think it's a valuable tool, but Whitney, I don't know the answer to your question. I wonder, um, I don't know if it, it retains that YouTube video or not. I don't, I don't think it does. So you might be able to then use that as a, um, yeah, it, it actually does right? not. It becomes an ed puzzle link versus a YouTube link. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. The content within the video is still coming from YouTube, I think. No, I know. That's the hard part. That's a really good question. Um, the other question was, is it free? So you can get 20 videos for free. So if you're, you know, if you, you play your cards right, you can actually go in and, uh, you know, you could figure out how you can get rid of videos, those types of things if you needed to. It's not too bad. I mean, again, there are school district um, uh, you have to request a quote for a school district, $11.50 per month per, for a teacher account. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to make sure I mentioned here is that um, there's actually an extension for this. I don't know if you have the, that extension installed, Dean, and you can turn it on, but there's an Edpuzzle extension. And what that Edpuzzle extension does is it actually puts a link into, there you go. All right, we're going to turn that on. And Dean, I want you to go up to that YouTube video there, up on your tab. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Yeah. And then um, you might have to ref yeah, click on that guy. And let's just see where your videos or whatever. We're going to open one of those videos up. And what you'll notice, let's see if you click on, um, it should have a, wait for it. See where it says edit with Edpuzzle there down on the bottom right of the video. So if you have that extension installed and you happen to find a video on YouTube that you want to edit and you have that extension, you can actually just click on that and it's going to take you right to Edpuzzle, right to the editing feature uh, inside of Edpuzzle there. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's, let's just play a little bit. Again, this is your time to kind of explore this tool. Um, if you're interested in that extension, remember we went to that, um, we went to that uh, Chrome web store to download that extension. It's just called Edpuzzle. And um, from there you can, you can just uh, kind of take off. We'll give you we're at 236 now. We'll give you about five minutes to, to go through that. And um, then we'll kind of come back and uh, regroup and uh, reflect a little bit on this one. Hey guys, I have a question. Um, so when you put these, these uh, questions in, does it keep track of the students' responses and grades and all that? If you connect it to Classroom, uh -huh. then yes, it will. Okay. And it will even import those grades into Google Classroom for you. Oh, okay. So that makes it, it's like that whole, you know, the create a quiz assignment, right, in Google Classroom. Well, this is another way to bring grades into Google Classroom without you having to double enter, you know, double enter those grades. Okay. And then will it also show if they, like, skip the question? I think you can I think you can set it to where it doesn't allow you to go on if you oh. don't answer that question. Okay, so it does have that option. Yeah. And if you're not using Google Classroom, you as the teacher can log into your Edpuzzle and the, their grades will be an Edpuzzle. So you would have to import it to whatever other grade book you have, but they are tracked. Yeah. So Trisha, you've used this before then. I love Edpuzzle. <laughs> you want to talk about how you use it? 
Uh, well, we do a lot of students on their own timelines. I'm at an alternative high, high school. So it's, I mean, I use it where I, I think a lot of people in traditional schools would show a video and have a classroom discussion. Um, and then you can set up your alerts with Edpuzzle or Google Classroom. So I'll know when they're getting to that point and then I can go meet with that student and discuss with them. Um, or pull a small group of students as they're getting there. I just really like the breaking up of the content rather than like dumping, here's a video. It works great um, if you have subs, but you still want some interaction versus like plug and play this video. Um, lots of good, um, I have a lot of videos on like simple, I'm an English teacher, so um, I don't know, I did one last year on there, there, and there. And I just pulled someone else's and then added a couple questions at the end with my own student sentences. Um, so it, then it made it applicable to our classroom. And then I can push that video out to whatever student needs that video. And I've just got it in my bank of videos. It's interesting, Trisha, you said, you said something that's really interesting. You can actually, so once you find somebody that you like, you don't have to just, you're not stuck with that one. You actually can, make a copy of it, take it in as yours, and then edit the questions, do anything you'd like to that video to make it yours. The, the big borrow steel teacher adage, right, that we all live by, well, I live by anyway. I'm not sure if Edpuzzle can be used in, in schoology, as schoology, I don't know if that's, I'll, I, I can check that and see. It, it should be, schoology is, um, just a learning, a learning system, right? A classroom management system, much like Google Classroom. I don't know if it pulls in the content like it does in Google Classroom, however. Actually, it looks like you can. It, it um, pulls content in. Looks like it does, yeah. It's a it's a bit of a process to do it, but um, you can do that. Wow. Yep. Jeff, can I ask how did you um or do you not sure which ones? How did you guys confirm that you could use a Schoology? Like, where would, are you sure. in? I'm just going to send this link to you right here. There you go. So that's just kind of showing you how I just did a search for it. And it, okay. Yeah, it kind of has the, um, the whole piece there. You got to get your IT and admins involved and the teachers and um, yeah. Well, that could be helpful for a lot of our teachers though. So thank you. Yeah. Must be power school users out there too, huh? <laughs> With Schoology. <laughs> Brandon. <laughs> we don't use, we don't use, we use Infinite Campus. <laughs> Google Classroom. Uh, we're going to give you a couple more minutes to, to play inside of um, one of those tools anyway. And then we're going to come back together and, and have a discussion. It's a little harder remotely with the, with the silence, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and feel free to ask questions as you're um, working through those too, please.
Tom, Tom, you talked about um, Screencastify Submit. Did you use that this or this spring? I did pretty successfully. Can you talk a little bit about how that worked? Yeah, um, being an engineering teacher, uh, specifically robotics, was kind of tough to transition to with all the hands-on that the kids do. And so VEX Robotics put out an, an online virtual environment for kids to use. And in order for me to see what their code actually did and, and whether or not the robot was successful, I sent out uh, a Screencastify submit and had the kids just um, record. And I, and I encouraged them to talk to me too during you know, the, the robot doing his thing, but they, they were silent. <laughs> I was like, tell me a joke, do something. But they were really hesitant to do that. But um, it went right to my Google Drive. I got alerts by email. It was seamless, it was really great. Wow. So it didn't, it didn't um, integrate with Google Classroom. Um, I, well, I sent it through Google Classroom. I did. I put it on my Google Classroom as an alert and told them to look at their email, their Gmail. Gotcha. And it went right to their, their Gmail, and they just clicked on it and showed me their video. It was, it was great. Awesome. And it yeah, sounds it was, like, and is that still, it's not free anymore, is it? Oh, oh it's free. It was a beta. I was part of the beta program. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'll have to check it out because I haven't used it since June. So it's saying it's saying educators through July 31st, but you never know, you know, who knows. Right. Um, and it looks like Michelle used uh, submit as well. Michelle, you want to, you want to um, talk about how you use that? I had to find the unmute. Um, yeah, I had kids do a response. Instead of doing a written response, I had them do a verbal and a video response for me. And uh, it was kind of a cumulative end assignment, so it was kind of fun to see their response to the assignments I gave and their reaction of what learning looked like. And I had a couple of them, um, there were sisters got together and did a, a regular video parody of what it was like under this COVID. <laughs> so it was really, it was really kind of fun. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, we have another really good question here um, uh, from Kathy. Uh, anyone have any experience using these apps in special education classes? Somebody want to want to jump in on and answer that question? <laughs> the wait time or thoughts? Even if you didn't use it in a special education course, you may have some thoughts on how you might use it. I'm a little bit nervous about using these in special ed courses because I'm not sure how, I mean, I have groups of three or four kids. How am I supposed to put the videos out and not give away who they're going to? Anybody have thoughts on that? If you're using Google Classroom, you can share just to an individual kid, like an assignment specifically for them, and it's not shown on everyone else's stream. So that might be one option for you to use. No one else knows they have it, even if it's a separate topic. Um, it only shows up in their classroom stream. That might be an option. Absolutely. And in fact, not just, you know, you can share with multiple students, right? So if you have four kids that are in the same class and you want to share that video with them in Google Classroom, you can select those four students to receive that. And like Whitney says, nobody else will see that they received that video. So last year when we ended out the year, we were just putting stuff on our website. I do pre-K through 12th grade. Um, so I have mixed age groups and everything and we were just told to put an elementary page out and put the links on there and then so everything I did was so generic I I'm I can't do that again this year I've got to find something that's more specific and I guess that's where my worry is, is so if I'm working with you know kindergarten first grade kids putting a Google classroom in that they can access I don't, I don't know. That's, I guess that's what my problem is. 
Yeah. Um, so it looks like Aubrey, um, she says she did that with several one-on-one -on -one kids this uh, year as well. Aubrey, do you want to talk about how you did that? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I um, just like, I think it was Whitney that was saying, I can actually do my video so you can see me, if it works. Um, you can you can specify that Google Classroom, so you can make one Google Classroom and have several topics, and you can upload those videos specifically to the audience of the kids that you want. So if you want to make an assignment or a video um, under a topic for like a group of three kids, you can just put those three kids in there. Um, I think we were given the go ahead, I think as a state, that if you're working with those kids in a group, they can know each other's names. Um, and the parents can know those kids' names too if they're at home, um, just because it would just be like them working with those kids at school. And so you can specify different groups of kids. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't have to be grade level. And you can just upload those videos just for those kiddos, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, all right, perfect, thank you. Um, so another another question, I, and, and thanks Aubrey for, for that uh, information. Uh, Lissa has a good question about Edpuzzle. If I assign something through my Google Classroom, do students have to use a log in for Edpuzzle? I work at MCPS and HERP, we cannot use it. So uh, Edpuzzle, is that blocked at um, MCPS? Does anybody know that? It's not, sorry, this is Kate Barley. It's not blocked, but um, with the data, it's not on our approved list of data. Um, oh God, data sharing agreement is what right. I'm staring at. And it's not, a, it's not approved, but it's not not approved. But um, so I've used it whole group, but I feel like when you try to assign it as a quiz, then you have to log in with your, um, Google login, is that correct? Well, I, I don't think, I think you can use, um, I think you can use a, a personal login if you wanted to, but if you want to use it with Google Classroom, then I think you're going to have to use a, um, a school account. I'm just looking at the, the Student Privacy Alliance here to see if Edpuzzle has an agreement uh, with the state of Montana. Um, Ed Puzzle, let's just see where we're at here. Let's do a search. So it looks like um, Malta School, um, looks like they're the ones that kind of got that approved, 518-2020. So because that is the case, then all other schools, all they have to do is complete an Exhibit A so the way that the, the Privacy Alliance works is that one school kind of has to do the legwork to get that agreement with the um, company. And then other districts can then use that agreement, fill out an Exhibit A, and they also then are approved to use that, um, uh, that, that application. So that might be something you talk to your, ed, your um, tech department about and see if they can't get that taken care of. Other thoughts or questions? Good questions here. Really, honestly, really good questions. Um, we had we had one more um, with the uh, Flipgrid. I think a lot of you have seen Flipgrid. If not, it's worth um, kind of going uh, through the rest of that presentation and just jumping into Flipgrid. That's a great um, application for um, video responses. So maybe just uh, giving your student uh, that, that uh, prompt sentence starters, those types of things, and then having them respond. The nice thing about um, Flipgrid is, is that you can access it from a phone, a computer, you know, an iPad, something like that. There's a QR code that's generated as well. Um, and it's just very easy to get um, video up to that um, to that platform. So if you haven't checked out, if you have not checked out um, Flipgrid, that's worth uh, checking out for sure. Yeah, and one of one of the teachers we shared this uh, a couple of days ago with another teacher group. One of the teachers said, you know, kids really enjoy Flipgrid because it's very similar to TikTok, right? 
you have the 30 second time limit or the 15 second time limit and um, you can record those videos and make it fun. And I think that's part of this as well, right? Yeah. So we're already getting comments about Flipgrid being awesome. So, um, which it is. And, and you know what, again, I think that, that one of the things about the, the, the video pieces that we've showed is it does allow you to be a little bit more flexible in your delivery or in you know student feedback or student creation you know tools versus a, you know a standard google doc or a slide presentation and not that there's anything wrong with that but again if we go back to that word cloud and we look at engagement as being the most concerning or the biggest struggle we need to figure out how we're going to do that i was just told that district one can't use it hmm, all right I, I don't, I guess I don't know why that would be the case, but okay. Um, <laughs> um, just a couple, a couple of things here um, that we want to make sure that um, you guys know, we said this in our last session, but we also want to make sure that folks know um, Blackfoot Communications has done a tremendous amount for schools. Um, for, for many years. And uh, as Dean said in our keynote, that um, they just stepped up. I mean, they went the, the extra mile. They did everything they could to make sure schools were connected, teachers were connected, and even kids were connected during the, um, the, the, the spring remote learning um, piece there. So um, when you get a chance, please just uh, make sure you reach out to Blackfoot and you let them know just how grateful, grateful we are. I mean, they were sponsoring this, uh, this um, conference completely. So please make sure you just say thanks to those folks and uh, when you get a chance. Yeah, absolutely. They've been a supporter for education in Montana for a long time, and uh, they continue to do so. So um, as, as Jeff just said, do reach out and say thanks if you do get a chance to do that. Um, and just for, just for the sake of, you know, tallying or, or making sure that you're, um, we've got your uh, record of you being here, please make sure you just say that, just put your name in there and in a chat, just say, hey, this is so-and-so, that way we know. After the session is done, we're gonna save this chat string and Daisy will use this as a way to, um, um, to validate folks being on. And Keenan, did you wanna say anything? Well, if you're, I see that you're on. So did you wanna, did you wanna make a guest appearance? <laughs> um, sure. I just thank you guys all for attending and hopefully this is going to be beneficial as we head into next school year with so many unknowns. So everyone stay safe and healthy and keep doing what you're doing and taking great care of all of our kids. We appreciate you. Awesome. Thanks, Kina. Thanks, Kina. All right. Um, any last thoughts, comments, questions before we end? If, I think if you commented in the last section, if, if you didn't put your name, it's going to be, there's a, there's a from piece there in the chat string. So you should be okay if you didn't, if you didn't do that. And, and like Dean said, and we've said, uh, flexibility is the name of the game. So we're going to have to figure out how to modify and manage all of this stuff.